Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I'm sitting telling you some art history stories while well, occasionally knitting at this point already. Uh, so uh, welcome to another video and um, well <laughs> before we will start. So in the last video I promised that uh, today's video will be about a French artist. Well not today's, it was due three weeks ago but I and it was ready, like I, I swear to God, it was ready. But I had some kind of technical problems that I have no idea. Like, I don't know, like you see, like I I reshot this video for the past like few weeks four times because, well, because first of all, it was like some, first time was some kind of technical difficulties. I don't know what was happening, what was going on. Then I accidentally deleted everything then the video editor when I'm editing just refused to let me save this video and I could not share it through this uh, like editing app like whatever and uh, yeah and because I was filming it like more like I, again four times I already I feel myself like a broken record and I mean I can't uh oh the artist that I want that I was making video is Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun so a very famous one if you um familiar with, familiar with uh, French history and you are a fan of especially period of a revolution and like prior the reign of uh, Marie Antoinette uh, and just overall Marie Antoinette herself uh, you probably know at least uh, Vigée Le Bon's painting because like the most like, iconic paintings of Marie Antoinette is made by Vigée Le Bon uh, so yeah at least visually biggest part of you most definitely uh, know her uh, yeah, but uh, but I can't. I literally can't anymore to talk about her. But I will make a video about her definitely because she uh, she deserves to be remembered and she deserves to have her own segment on my channel. So yeah, so I I will make a video. I I promise a little bit later, maybe when I will you know forget about uh, this info a little bit because I at this point you know you can wake me up in the night and I will retell you her biography by heart and it's you know it's it's annoying for me and it's uh, like I feel myself bored basically. Uh, so I decided to switch a bit to another artist. So the video today will be well not maybe so long as I am like as I like to make them um, but uh, nevertheless this uh, painter this uh, woman artist another woman artist but today it, we're going to be talking about Italian woman as master as uh, she was like you know a bit um, like earlier than uh, Vigée Lebrun so uh, so well as you can see by the name of the video we're going to be talking about uh, Rosalba Carriera I will link down below a few of the like quite good articles they're pretty short but they are pretty informative and like one of them is uh, uh, actually you can read the, the they are making an accent on her um, techniques you know how she was working so because I will not um, talk about this in depth in a video uh, so yeah because there's like not uh, like a lot a lot about her like uh, with Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun because there is like there is plenty of info about her, so I tried to narrow down the info as much as possible. But still, at the end of the day, I had a video for like more than one hour, uh, and this is just taking you know the most crucial parts of her life. Uh, but here, uh, yeah, it's not uh, we, like it's kind of like enough, but not too much. Uh, but still, we can you know see the the life and how she was developing uh, her style and everything. Yeah, but without going in such depth uh, as with uh, Vigée Le Bon. The pictures also, I will try to show them chronologically. I will not, like, really stop on them. Um, but, uh, yeah, so without further... And I will not be, to be honest, knitting anything today. I will just talk it with you because I, I, I don't want to knit anything. So, yeah, so that without further ado, uh, let's, uh, let's start with our today's... Uh, woman. Rosal Bocalliera, she was born in, uh, well, either in 1673 or 1675, so you will see few informations. So it was somewhere, somewhere there, 73 or 75. And she was born in a family um, that is, uh, like, the, it, it was said that they uh, were considered like a lower middle class, so they were not rich, but they were not um, struggling either. And her mom, she was uh, well, kind of an artsy person herself because she was making um, lace. She was designing and making lace. 
and this is maybe half result but you know got into all of this art stuff because starting from a very young age she was painting leads for uh, snuff boxes and snuff boxes is basically like these decorative boxes that you can use for storage or just as a decoration she was painting them to then sell for tourists in venice oh did i say that she was born in venice i well she was born in venice <laughs> and a part of um Rosalba, there were like oh, in total there were actually three sisters in the family. So it was Rosalba, it was uh, Giovanna, and also Angela. So I don't know who is like the oldest, who is the youngest, but it was just you know mentioned like that. Getting back to the snuff boxes, so this um, this thing, you know, this case uh, uh, turned out to be very profitable. Uh, because uh, the large paintings were expensive and they were also very, very difficult to transport but uh, well we human beings so we always wear the same and obviously a lot of people wanted to have something you know uh, well basically so I don't know whether it's a thing in uh, West Europe but at least in East Europe you will see that a lot of our in, in a lot of our houses on the fridge we have magnets from different places where we go and well people wanted to have this kind of like you know modern version of uh, fridge magnets uh, like you know those little memories uh, from the place that they visited and thus they were buying this uh, snuff boxes then a little bit further in time in uh, 1698 uh, Rosaimba started to um, you know practice in like painting small pictures small portraits which uh, uh, well which ex this is exactly what made uh, Rosaimba carriera uh, popular like enormously popular in Europe a bit later as wealthy people they started to um, they started to order those small portraits from the miniaturist artists and uh, just overall you see so we are talking about the rococo period and um, this is a very this light you know very like coquettish flourishes uh, period of time uh, with uh, like uh, light colors and light subjects uh, and stuff like that and plus this was the period of time where these little miniature pictures they became super popular you know so you, you could i don't know put them in your pocket wear them as jewelry actually wear them as some hat pieces you know like had decoration basically Rosalba Carriera she found her little niches we can say uh like just in time from the start i mean uh she had so many orders that during her lifetime like in the future also she was actually um turning to her sisters for help first uh, overall works that she was doing the, those mini pictures and mini portraits they were done on uh parchment even though we're talking about uh, the uh, like late late the end of uh, what is this 17th century the beginning of 18th century but still she was using parchment or vellum and uh, if you don't know what vellum is so this is uh, technically this is parchment also but uh, back in time when uh, like the early medieval times and middle middle ages uh so like middle middle ages uh vellum it was uh, a thing that, it was a parchment that made from calf skin specifically but then when you know the book illumination uh started to die because of uh, printing they started like vellum they started to call vellum just basically a parchment a parchment of a very high quality so i think here it's uh, uh, well it's either way maybe she was using some calf skin or she was just using some like you know a high standard uh, parchment however obviously those images were not very um like successful because they were not very lively though and generally they were quite flat and well i think if you're familiar a bit with um medieval manuscripts you can like you can see that that was a hard um material to work on and most of the time those pictures are like i mean in medieval manuscript right those illuminations it's very hard to make something um dimensional so it's like 2d mostly yeah so so here is the same thing i can imagine that it was pretty hard to work on parchment and painting those 
um, portraits. Plus, I, this is why I'm not sure whether she was using oil there or a tempera, something like that. So, yeah, so it was, I mean, if she was using tempera, it was even harder because tempera is a hard media to work with. I mean, compared to oil, it's like way harder to work. Uh, so she started, um, you know, obviously she started to evolve and she started to experiment with her materials and uh, she decided to get, um, so she um, put it aside, the parchment, and she started to paint on ivory. And obviously it was working better because it's a little bit easier to work on ivory. Plus, for example, the skin of those so who she painted uh, looks way better on ivory and just overall the images were way way better it is uh, also mentioned that uh, she had a pretty uh, um interesting manner of working with her customers because overall she did not ask them to pose for her so she started the work with uh just painting some garments yeah some dresses or some male uh clothes uh, then she was doing some background so she was basically you know creating the uh, full work and just then she uh, when she was getting to the face part she was asking uh, the customer to come to her workshop or, or to her studio whatever and to sit pose for her for a bit but even uh, with this uh, she was uh, known to constantly um, invite her friends or some of her family like whatever just someone basically so this customer who was sitting posing for her uh where you know he was able or she was able to ch chit chat with uh, with those uh, friends of Rosalba and basically have a good time uh you know laugh or something like that and that's why maybe like the, the depicted uh, on like in her works are not so tense uh, mostly they are like pretty flirtatious as we can say they are light uh, and uh, etc but still she was able to despite you know this lightness she was still able to preserve the grandeur of her customers because you know they were like dusters you know and just overall very rich women or men or whatever i wanted also here to say that um, mostly she was, we can see by her portfolio in modern words, uh, she was mostly painting women and uh, children. However, there is obviously some male portraits, um, but I, like, on my taste, like, I don't really like her male work, so I don't really think that they are pretty successful. They are very, I like, I don't even know what words, to be honest, to use here. I just don't like them. They are not so um psychologically deep as her women's like uh, her women's portraits they are just there you know they are just there <laughs> so uh well except a few like for example the portrait of Vato but I will show you it a bit later and I will mention about this obviously um uh, and uh, I also remember reading somewhere that she actually was a bit criticized back in her time about her male portraits also because uh, but back then it was the problem was not that she was not skillful or something like that the problem was is that she was um her male uh, per portraits her like male characters were too feminine which like you know whatever the hell that means because i don't personally i don't see this femininity like at all plus uh are we really talking like about this problem in rococo period like people you like all of you back then looked pretty feminine as we can say you know if you want to use this word so it's like a very very like strange uh, um comment basically on that and uh, considering that like rococo and like in rococo style you know a lot of men like i mean nobility obviously uh they were doing um ballet um they were you know wearing like very you know those um feminine color as we call them now so pinkish you know those yellowish colors this stuff like that because women were actually in this period of time they were wearing more like uh, brown colors you know something like that but men uh, like pink color especially was very popular in rococo among men and uh, yeah 
well back then obviously they did not have such a division in colors well they did but it was you know it was not by the gender as we have now this i'm sorry shit about like a pink is a girl's color a blue is a boy's color and there's like completely gendered stuff back then it was not like that because back then color had it was mostly about symbolism rather than gender she had also a fixed format of her painting so it was like this bust painting uh, a little bit so it's like till the shoulders a little bit lower than the shoulders but basically like i'm sitting right now and uh, yes it was her favorite format and it is a very good format if we will talk you know about technicalities of art history you know when we are analyzing some portrait this is a good um this is considered to be a more intimate uh, format plus also as we can see especially with women that she was uh, adding sometimes some attributes i read someone that you had to like pay her a bit for that uh but i'm not sure if i understood this correctly but well she was adding sometimes some attributes in forms of like um some jewelry some i don't know some birds some flowers some um, maybe I, there, there, there I remember somewhere the painting with um, those women with the brush uh, and the palette and stuff like that. So she was adding some kind of, you know, char character or again, um, attributes of the person that she was painting. So when she was, uh, uh, when she started to work, obviously she was working mainly with oil or maybe some other medias. Again, I don't know, I haven't saw this, but oil definitely. Um, but now, now she is known as the, she's a famous pastelist. We know her mostly as a, a pastel master and the one who really, you know, um, blew this uh, media up. And uh, she was encouraged to work with pastel by the British uh, man, uh, Christian Cole. So he was a diplomat and he was also a pastel amateur himself you know how to say it correctly amateur pastelist himself will be created like that and during this period of time also the pastel was considered as uh, an inferior medium and one uh, more suited for a woman because here also in the medias is the same thing as with i think i mentioned in some previous video but i don't remember where uh, that uh, back in time, uh, especially in like academies, there were a hierarchies of genres. Same was with media. Yeah, with gen like academy, they they demanded uh, for their their paintings to do uh, mostly historical genres, uh, then mythological or allegorical one, and just then it was uh, portraits. No, it was landscapes, then portraits, and then still life. So still life is something that was, you know, they were like, everyone can paint that. When in reality, it's not like that. And not a lot of those masters who were, you know, painting those uh, like enormously big battlefield paintings were able to do a, a good and adequate uh, still life. But well, back then it was like this. Media the same. Oil, it was, you know, the the queen the king whatever of all of the medias and pastels it was something that well it was predominantly used for sketches for some uh prepara preparatory works for some i don't know informal works but definitely not something for you know an official portrait uh which is basically was used for some not so serious parts of the work uh while Carriera, she started to use this for her official portraits, you know, of kings and queens and the highest of nobility. Uh, plus, uh, also we'll add about academies, uh, part of the genres also, they had the fixated uh, um, size of canvas, for example, they have the, the fixated colors that they were, you know, that they could use uh, for, for their paintings. And this is why it's... Uh, um, this is why it's important for artists, especially those who are going like the artists in training in academies, the young ones, to learn history of art, or well, at least learn the history of all of these movements and uh, genres and how everything was going on, because uh, a lot of like young painters, especially after school, they are getting into these academies with these ideas that, oh, they will, 
you know, these ideas of the uh, movie-like situation, when in reality it's not like that, this is a very competitive, very toxic environment, and, um, well, you know, I, I'm always saying that um, academism is basically like ballet in dancing, uh, this is basically, I don't know, like dressage in horse riding, so, yeah, you need to master the basics before you can do whatever the hell you want. This is basically like we are saying that before, you know, breaking the rules, you need to know those rules. So, so this is completely the same thing. And uh, those the kids, they're getting into academies and obviously they their expectations are completely uh, shut down. Now what's... Uh, shattered? And uh, yeah, and they're starting to lose themselves. They're starting to critique everything. They're starting to get like, oh, this academy, it kills my creativity. It kills uh, uh, like everything. I hate it. And plus uh, uh, the amount of young uh, artists in training in academies that I heard saying, why the hell do I need to learn history of art? Like I'm a painter. Why do I need to go on those like uh, on those lectures and I was just constantly you know saying being like what the hell do you mean what the hell do you mean why the hell you need what so this is also a big problem that they are not learning history of art they are not learning all of these things they are not developing themselves um intellectually uh don't get me wrong though um academy as I said it's a tough place to be really because there is plenty, like, the teachers there are, mm, the teachers there are characters, definitely characters, so you need to get used to that, because this is, you know, the thing that it, it's, it's very hard to um, change, on the other hand, I'm not sure whether we need even to change it, because again, this is a certain thing, it is stable, you know, this is the certain part of our life well not our life just overall you know the art life that it was almost always there starting with the brother Karachis who actually yeah, started the academies in Italy and uh, yeah and I think you always will be you just need to understand that you are not when you are getting into an academy you are not getting there to be um tell me I tell you creative you are there to get skills to develop yourself again intellectually in terms of art history and other subjects but first of all you are there to learn those basic um, dead skills because I, I hate academies like I really well maybe not hate okay it's just a very, very strong word but I really dislike it I cannot name you a single academy artist that I was like oh, this is so beautiful no I, I dislike this I agree that those pictures are dead because they lack creativity again they lack uh, the free spirit in them they lack um freedom in them you yeah? know i mean the artist freedom because all of this is fixated all of this you know you the, you know the the, the uh, amount of people that needed to be on a painting it was fixated as i said uh the size of canvas was fixated the colors was fixated the execution of this was fixated all of this was it was rules and you could not break those rules if you were breaking them you were out of academy but uh the thing is just you see now uh, it's not something so prestigious to be in academy as it was back in time, right? But uh, overall, yeah, overall it's a problem. So maybe this video will get to some of you who are painting and you are rather a painter than, like, you know, a theor theoretical art person as I am. Um, and if you want to go somewhere to academy, just prepare yourself for that. That this is not a place where you will be creative. This is not the place. Well, I mean, at least like in Europe, uh, well yeah because uh, the art schools in us it's um <laughs> it's a thing <laughs> you know well there's a lot of things in the us but uh when i first i remember seeing someone from um art school somewhere in new york and somewhere else also i believe and i was so shocked about what you're doing there so like you're literally um 
award <laughs> you know the portfolio that also uh kids were sending and well i mean i understand this is the, the you are making more well you they are making more the accent on tell me i tell you on contemporary art uh, not even modern contemporary art uh, while in europe I mean, especially, you know, those who are training in Italy, <laughs> I, I bet that those were, the, you know, the, those type of things that they are doing in America is like something else. But uh, yeah, but still, at the end of the day, this is what you need to prepare yourself, that you will learn a lot of anatomy, you will paint a lot of still lives, you know, to you will paint it through shapes and forms. Uh, and uh, this is what you will have to do, because uh, at the end of the day, art is math. And this is what uh, a lot of kids are constantly forgetting. Uh, when uh, math is art also, that math kids are constantly forgetting also. Uh, but uh, yeah, but sorry, I guess blown away about uh, a bit about that. Uh, so just, you know, a little like a little peek into uh, academism. So let's continue with uh, Rosanne Ben with her pastels. So we know that, uh, well, at least it is mentioned that she started to work with pastels uh, somewhere around 1703. And she uh, quickly became a master in pastels, obviously, and actually started, she started to be recognized for that. So there was her, uh, she was not the first one uh, to use uh, pastels as a main media for her works, because there was some other um, painter, and I will not remember his name right now, like prior to her, and it was using, uh, like, that was his main media to work with. And he was also very popular and people really liked his works, like his pastel works. Uh, so yeah, so it was not something that um, Rosalba came up with, but uh, she also became one of the most distinctive uh, uh, artists who was working in pastel. So she became, you know, uh, she became such a skilled artist actually that in 1705, so just within, like if if we will uh, trust the date the uh, 1703 that she started to work with pastel that just in a few years like in two years in 1705 she was actually admitted to the academy of saint luke in rome so this is academy of art and it is said it was said that she became the first ever woman to be admitted into academy uh, don't know whether it's true or not uh, maybe maybe it's possible that it is true but uh, well it is said like that and uh, also interestingly then in 1708 she painted her self-portrait uh, in pastels obviously and she presented it to the uh, Uffizi gallery so this is a gallery in uh, Florence uh, uh, well it's still there obviously it's one of the most famous museums in the world still and they have uh, so that was a very prestigious thing to do because they uh, have their an enormously big collection of uh, artists' uh, self-portraits. So they were actually, well, back in time, um, I don't know about now how this collection is going on, but back in time, yeah, uh, they were actually contacting the artists. Like Elizabeth Vigelle Bon, she's the same. You you have, uh, there is uh, her prop, uh, portrait there uh, because they asked her, they actually asked her, can you please paint your self-portrait? Because how famous she was and well-known she was. So. Here is the same. She presented the self-portrait, and well, it's uh, presumably it's still there, most definitely still there. Then, moving a bit further, in uh, 1716, she met a famous uh, art collector and also patron, uh, Pierre Crozat. So he was a patron of uh, like for many many artists, and he invited Carriera to Paris actually, and. Uh, well, in March of 1720, then, so a few years after that, uh, she decided that, okay, let's go to Paris. And she took all of her family, so it's like her mother, so I presume her father died at this point already, or maybe he was still working at home, I don't know. But she took her mom, her two sisters, and um, her brother in law, so I believe it was Angela's, um, Angela's uh, husband, who was also a pretty famous uh, painter back in time. Uh, and they moved for one year to Paris and here she was widely successful also and her pastels were uh, very warmly taken 
and uh, especially among a royal family. So during her stay for this like one year, short, so she was in Paris just from 1720 to 21, uh, she painted 36 portraits of uh, royal family. So this is how uh, well fond of her uh, they were. Uh, it was also said that she was accepted into the Royal Academy of Art. Uh, and uh, here it was mentioned, mentioned that she was the first foreign woman, not like a woman, there were women already there uh, before her, but she was the first foreign woman to ever enter the academy. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so she was painting the rich, um, uh, rich people, the richest people, even we can say it like that in France. Uh, and uh, that uh, gave her literally a fortune. She became a very rich woman. And here also still she was, uh, you know, she had this so many orders that she still was asking for help from her sisters. Uh, they were still assisting her. And uh, interestingly also what, uh, during this period, this one year, she was actually keeping a diary. And I found it in French. I will link down it below so you can read it. Uh, and I, I didn't read it, but I just, you know, like run through the pages with my eyes. So uh, just to check some info, just to see maybe there is some more info that I can uh, take for this video. Uh, but there were like not too many. So yeah, but it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, and this is from 18, the, the, the end of 19th century, so 1860, some 65, I believe, was, was published, something like that. I don't remember. Uh, but, uh, well, if you know French, uh, it's, uh, well, it's pretty funny, you know, actually. It's pretty um, understandable. So, you know, I, again, I read it like a little bit, so I get through those, uh, the text. So it's, um, it, it's all right. Uh, so, yeah, so if you know French, you can read it. So, so maybe there is somewhere an English translation. I don't know. Well, I mean, I didn't found it, um, didn't find it, uh, um, but well, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we have this one year journal from her, uh, from Paris, where she was describing in details, like everything was going on. Uh, I don't know. So as I understood also by all of that, that she did not continue to, uh, to write this diary uh, when they came back from Paris, so, so I don't know uh, whether there is some kind of continuation or not. But well, after that, in uh, from 1721 to 1730s, she lived uh, mostly in uh, Italy, um, and she was like, uh, like in, in Venice specifically, so she came back home. Uh, but she was still obviously traveling to like here and there in Italy and painting well, mostly wealthy Italian women, wealthy Italian nobility. Uh, in 1730 then, uh, by the invitation of uh, Tony and I tell you, by the invitation of Emperor Charles IV, she was invited to the Vienna court and she was there for like a little bit, uh, I believe it was like six months or something like that. Uh, and she was... Uh, uh, painting well the nobility, she was painting the royal family, uh, she was painting the um, future empress Maria uh, Maria Teresa, and also it is said that she actually taught her a little bit uh, how to paint. Uh, but uh, uh, among all of the royal nobility, royal families, uh, she was especially adored back in time uh, uh, by the Polish king actually. So he constantly was like making her this um, job offers, you know, to come and stay with him and to just paint, to work just uh, with him, on him and paint just him and his family. And that was like multiple job offers. So he was constantly saying this to her, but she was uh, refusing every time. Uh, however, still, you know, it, it this did not really upset him uh, too much because uh, the end of his days and actually his son also after after him they still continue to be her patrons we also know that she was a teacher so she had a group of uh, young ladies uh, uh, that she was teaching them how to do portraits and well as she knew especially pastel portraits however well some of them is um, you know we remember their names so some of them is lost uh, uh, for us uh, and they have been forgotten, and um, some of them were pretty successful artists uh, uh, during their lifetime, so we don't really know about them now, but 
during their lifetime they were um, doing all right and it was uh, you know it, it has been speculated uh, as i assume back in time also that some of uh, Carriera's works were actually uh, done by her students some of her stu students and this is just overall the problems with um, you know the problems and complications with the attributions of uh, Rosalba's works because uh, in general she did not sign and did not date any of her works uh, so it is now very difficult for you know art historians to uh, attribute uh, them and put them chronologically well but still I mean uh, it, it was done a, a bit and uh, in addition also with the growing popularity of the artist uh, uh, success successful copies began also to be made in Venice uh, uh, so I assume and maybe in some like you know other places in Italy and they were actually so successful that people really genuinely thought that those were Carriera's uh, works so this is another complication um, on the path of attributing her works because well some of them uh, well as it is said by those who are studying her that uh, they genuinely look like Carriera's works and uh, overall during her lifetime she was a friend a f she, no, she was friend, friend uh, so with a lot of different artists uh, and just overall again some nobility and people like that um, and one of them as I already mentioned uh, earlier was uh, Vato so he was a French he's, he's like one of the most uh, um well-known and popular artist now and also he's like one like of the most uh, famous representatives of uh, Rococo uh, one of the portraits that is constantly used actually to illustrate his appearance uh, belongs to well uh, Rosalba Carriera this is, this is what I was saying this is one of the portraits that I actually uh, really like because, uh, well, I don't know, you, you can clearly see that uh, they were friends, that there is some, something amical in this uh, portrait, so it is not so... Um, it is not so official, but it's not intimate either. There is those warm feelings uh, there in this painting. And plus also, I, I like that this portrait specifically is a little bit more dramatic than any other of her works you know this little li light on on the face uh, of Watto. i think she caught his appearance like i like i believe that uh, he really looked like that back in time despite this such huge social socialization my god uh despite having a lot of um uh, you know a lot of people around her she uh, never married she didn't have any kids uh, so she was i mean obviously considering how uh, many orders she had like you can imagine if she was asking her sisters to help her with that uh, so she didn't really have any time for that uh, however in uh 30s in the late 30s the situation started to get very worth in her family because in 1737 one of her sisters died i don't know who i believe it was uh, Giovanna first um, but yeah I remember seeing it somewhere but I don't remember uh, but well one of her sister died uh, and that really had a very heavy impact on her so she was um, she was grieving a lot uh, later like after that um, she uh, like I mean the artist uh, she she stopped drawing so much so she was just you know drawing here and there there's not a lot of works of this late period um, plus to that unfortunately at the end of the life Rosalba suffered a terrible tragedy tra tragedy like personal also uh, like personally physical tragedy for an artist she lost her eyesight she had a cataract and uh, it is um, well it is likely that the, the reason was you know the working on these miniatures uh, through her, her whole life because also like we can imagine right um, it, it is hard nowadays to do that with modern light and all these lamps and uh, all this again this modern little lights you can put it on your head or whatever uh, back then can you imagine working on those miniatures and uh, I think you know it, it's very hard so she had actually a few surgeries but uh, it didn't help 
didn't help at all and it was said that it was noted that by 1740 um no by seven yeah 1745 she was blind like completely blind and that was awful because she actually lived for another almost decade no what almost more than a decade she she died in 1757 so she lived those years blind and probably like i don't know what she was doing in those years but i believe that she had money you know she could take care of herself uh so yeah so while i was editing this video i found some like other info so in previous sources that i saw it was said that she outlived all of her relatives and everything but well i found that it's not true she uh, so her sister giovanna uh, did died and that was indeed a very like serious moment for rosalba she was very heartbroken about that but uh, when rosalba died uh, on so on december 19 1756 she um like she left a enormous fortune and this uh, fortune it is said to be 10 times bigger than Canaletto's one for example and Canaletto's one is was like the most like one of the most prominent artists and now like you know he is like one of the top artists and you like we are studying him uh, obviously in art schools in art uh, on art history like he's everywhere so it is just overall it's very impressive that she left 10 times more money than Canaletto and uh, so she asked to be buried in the same tomb as her sister Giovanna in the church of San Vio near her house and uh, uh, all of the money she left to her younger sister Angela uh, and so she was the main heir of uh, no hair hair oh my god i don't know how to pronounce this word correctly uh so yeah so she left all of the money to angela but she also left i mean rosalba uh, left a bit of money for her own funeral so i guess angela would not worry about that and uh yeah and so she was buried um in this uh, in the church of san vio however unfortunately this church was demolished in 1813 and so we don't have any trace of the carriera family tomb uh, so yeah things like that so I found it the in info like that and I want just to briefly you know add uh, just for like overall my impression of her works because um, when I was researching her I found out that well again visually I was familiar with her because I saw her a portrait of uh, uh, Maria Teresa uh, so yeah and I was like oh, okay I know you also uh, but overall just um, I am mind blown about you know the fact that everything that we are seeing is pastels and she indeed mastered her pastels to such a high level that it's it's insane and uh, as i already said also that um, briefly that i really prefer her women's portraits she her allegories uh, with women because men you know um except of vatu uh, portrait men portraits they all look the same for me so i actually was lost a bit when i was editing this video with some of the portraits i put it them you know in a different uh, places because they literally looked like the same person for me then i started to look up like oh yes okay it's a bit different but still you know so i am yeah not really fond of her, her men's portraits but uh, yeah but women especially her allegories those are very this um, tender very nice uh, some of them are very intricate like a, those um portrait like a young lady with a parrot or especially you know i really really like the portrait of uh, her um, so it's called like africa you can see or it's called oh so you can see the name an uh, allegory of africa so that is i believe one of her like for you know my, on, on my opinion and i like my taste that is one of the most realistic portrait that she uh, she's done and obviously biggest part of the portraits are very sugar coated but well <laughs> this is the same thing as now with photoshop you know we're paying money to look beautiful at least somewhere at least on paintings and uh, yeah so again i'll repeat myself that i am genuinely like 
I am so impressed about how people can, you know, that the, their arms are uh, growing from the f from where they supposed to grow, <laughs> because this is amazing. So mastering uh, pastels at such a level is just mind blowing, and I always thought that you know, watercolor is the hardest media to work with, but to be honest, I believe that like pastels actually is. So well, this is everything that I have for today. So as I said, I. Uh, linked down below some of the short articles so if you are interested you can go there and uh, like briefly read it i link down below also this diary this uh, one year diary that i that i said hope that it was still interesting for you i hope that you found out something new for yourself uh, which is always the most important for me and uh, just overall, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, what else, um, stay creative, like whatever, all the best. And, uh, well, hope to see you in the next videos. Bye-bye.